Good evening. How are you all? Uh, so the mic is a little bit formal, but I'm mostly doing this uh, for our friends out in the Twitter sphere and so forth. But uh, welcome, everybody. First of all, uh, so my name is Garth Ross. I'm the Vice President for Community Engagement here at the Kennedy Center. I know many of the people in the room, but not all of the people in the room. So I hope by the end of the evening, uh, that is no longer true. I hope to know everyone by the end of the night. Uh, right off the bat, I want to just thank uh, DJ One Love. Thank you so much for setting the tone here. Um, I want to thank the food and beverage crew. Thank you so much. Uh, everyone, you know that we've got uh, food and drink in the back in the ante room, so please uh, make yourself comfortable, keep yourself comfortable, be comfortable. Mikasa Sukasa uh, here at the Kennedy Center. Um, I also want to thank the, all of the tech crew. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, not just making folks look good and sound good, but also um, getting the message out uh, again on the web, which is really important because this is a conversation for everyone, not just for us folks here who are privileged to be here in the room together with each other as part of the conversation. So uh, I wanted to say a couple things. Um, the Kennedy Center is about 18 months into working under new leadership. Our president, Deborah Rutter, has a really powerful vision for um, for keeping the artists at the center of everything we do. And perhaps above all, she's really passionate about the role of artists in society, the role that artists play with and for all of us doing what they do, both on the stage and off the stage. And at the Kennedy Center over the years, with nine venues in this building that is 45 years old, we've given lots and lots and lots of opportunities for artists on the stage to let us hear their voice and see their greatness on the stage. But it's really also important to, uh, to create forums and platforms and, and welcome their voice off the stage because there are so many ways that their work um, kind of channels our aspirations. And um, you know, I want to know what artists, artists think because what they do makes such a big impact in our world. So I thank Deborah Rutter for this leadership. This is actually, you know, as you all know, everybody was invited from someone they know here. This is kind of a beta test of a kind of salon setting for socializing important ideas. And I want to land on that word for a, for a moment. Um, being social, really, this is something not just about hearing the artist's voice, but hearing each other's voices. So again, have a drink, get some food. Uh, meet someone that you haven't met before, and this is a conversation that we are starting tonight that we don't want to end tonight. Um, just want to say one other thing about the format, which is that there are little cards on the table, so if a question occurs to you, go ahead and write it down, and some of us on staff will be walking around and uh, picking those up occasionally and bringing them up to, the, uh, to our discussants here. And on that note, I also want to thank all of the Kennedy Center staff here because uh, we have a great team and we're so thrilled to work with all of you and for all of you. Um, keeping in the thanks lane, I want to thank Munch Joseph uh, with Head Rush Agency. Munch, all right. So there you go. I'd like to point out that was the first thank you tonight that got an applause. So this is, this is big. This is big. Um, Munch has been a longtime partner of the Kennedy Center and particularly our team uh, during the One Mic Festival. We uh, gathered a group of creatives in the district and, and environs um, that we refer to as the creative ecosystem, and it's really laid the groundwork for a more responsive relationship with the community here in DC, the community. There's no the community, but there is DC. There's all these folks here, and Munch is helping us to learn how to have DC in the KC and vice versa. So I want to thank you for that, Munch. Um, now. I think that was the last thing I wanted to say before I move on to, you know, obviously the most important thing here. So um, Dr. Dana Williams, the chair of the Department of English at Howard University. We are thrilled to have her here tonight leading the discussion. Um, she's professor of African American literature, a Louisiana native, graduate of Grambling State University and Howard University, where she earned her PhD in English. Her current book, book project, which is in process, um, Tony at Random examines Tony Morrison's editorship at Random House Publishing Company. So please welcome, and uh, don't trip on my notes there.
And now uh, Malcolm Jamal Warner, Emmy Award nominated actor and Grammy Award winner, a staple in television and film for nearly 30 years. Uh, he nabbed his first Grammy Award for Best Traditional R&B Performance on Robert Glasper's version of Jesus Children of America. All right. That should be our second clap for the night. I mean, I sh shouldn't have to prompt you all, but come on. Um, released his own EP entitled Selfless in September of 2015. Um, you can be seen in the role of AC Callings on FX's The People vs. O.J. Simpson, American Crime Story. But most importantly, he can be seen right over there, walking right over here. <laughs> Please welcome Malcolm Jamal Warner. <laughs> Good evening. Yeah. Thank you guys for coming out. Uh, this is this is the, the fir our first time doing this, so uh, we appreciate your your presence and your energy. Um, and I definitely appreciate Dr. Williams for uh, agreeing to moderate this. I asked him nicely well. to call me Dana, and he won't. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to. Okay. You have to. D have will to five. D will five. <laughs> D dub is for some reason stuck as a kid. Yeah. I don't know why. I'm not exactly sure. I get the MJ dub, so yeah, cool. you know, right, we'll take I'm, with, I'm with you. I'm Anything with over you. the one that I won't say. So because if I say it, then it'll stick. Okay, okay. got it. Well. So we want to welcome you all. He said in the introduction, he said when he spoke to both of us about what we wanted to do tonight is to have this very intimate conversation. So. 40 or 50 people in the room talking about some important issues um, in some light ways, but also in some very sophisticated and complicated and layered ways at the same time. So we thought that we'd bring as many people in as we possibly could in this wonderful, wonderful space, which um, had been underutilized in other ways when Malcolm first walked in the room, there was this moment of, wow. Right. Yeah. yeah, so the moment of reverence is, is, is here as well. So we're glad to have you all here. So we'll <coughs> play it by ear. And we will um, have some questions that are very directed, but it's also a curated conversation. So we'll take comments from you at different points. It really is, for this evening anyway, all of our living room. It's the living room that we share. Um, but join me again, though, in thanking Malcolm for being our first um, person in the salon. And we can't really think of a better person to be able to do it. Yeah, I appreciate so that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a broad focus. We want to talk a little bit about media bias and popular culture, but then also think about it um, in terms of racial perception and racial identity. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, Malcolm and his work um, and what it means to be an artist in this society and how we can begin to reshape um, some of those images um, through artistic work um, and what it means to be um, really active and engaged with the world on the stage and off the stage as well. Um, and then we'll end or somewhere in the middle at different points when the mood hits us and when it strikes us, he'll do some spoken word. We'll talk a little bit about some very mm -hmm. specific work, but we were joking a little bit earlier saying, you know, he's got Monday night and Tuesday night on lock. So we're working on all five <laughs> nights of the week. So Monday, <laughs> you can catch him on Monday, you can catch him on Tuesday yeah. for as long as the OJ series is running. So yeah, we're, we're gonna yeah, see if yeah, we can't yeah. work this thing where we got five days a week with Malcolm Jamal Warner. We'll we, see we, how we, we're working on we'll it. See how it plays out. We're gonna count Friday, because this is live stream. There like you this go. week you got hey, Friday. That's right. That's right. <laughs> So you were in town actually for this teaching and learning conference with NEA. You want to tell us a little bit about some of the work that you were doing with them? Yeah, so, so t earlier today was, um, was a, a, another conversation uh, like this, but we were t really talking specifically about um, education and how uh, the arts are uh, extremely important for young people in terms of um, creating well-rounded young people it's not just about you know just the books and the school rules but how there is uh, a completely different experience of learning through the arts you know and not necessarily for kids to uh, take theater because they want to be actors or you know want to be a professional dancer but to have that experience and, and have an experience of the uh, the creative side of the brain uh, being able to play uh, and learn uh, as well as the analytical side. So we had a really, really cool turnout. Um, a lot of, uh, lot of teachers and educators of color. Uh, we talked about the uh, importance of getting more uh, teachers of color, yep. in particular black men, uh, and just how you know, that landscape can really uh, help to increase the chances for academic success for, uh, for students of color. That's really important uh, on any number of levels uh, because students identify with people that 
look like them, that have a similar kind of worldview, that have similar kinds of social values. So I think most of us in this room at different points had an experience of connecting with someone kind of one-on-one, -on -one, and a lot of that has to do with whether or not you can identify readily with whether or not you think that that person is really invested right. yeah. in your yeah. well-being. Yeah. And very often, um, you think about young folks who are literally struggling with things that teachers don't know anything about, whether it is their own perception of themselves, whether it's self-image, whether it's something that's going on in the community or at home, and it's so important to have, you know, a teacher in front of you who can really, really um, show trust and identify those ways. But the art side of it, I think that balance in every way is really important. Getting the numbers up with the number of folks in the classroom, and we got some folks in the room who can speak to that very specifically. Everybody from Dr. Harrell to Dr. Bailey um, talking about uh, education and what it matters and what Dr. Harrell tells us all the time at Howard is you have to be as saturated in black culture if you're a black person yeah. as you are in what is 100% and other culture in many ways, yeah. just on the day to day, without even, yeah, without any, yeah. without even trying. So the effort has to be very intentional to integrate both art, but then also positive self perception as well. Yeah. What did that look like for you growing up? Because you seem really balanced. Yeah, my my dad. Well, I think it's Friday, so I, I'm a little balanced today. All right. But, you know, come Monday, <laughs> it's a whole different story. Um, my my dad was really um, really instrumental in giving me a sense of identity uh, and a sense of culture. Um, you know, one, he set me up uh, out the box because he named me Malcolm right. Jamal. Jeez, um, <laughs> the pressure. Um, but he named me after Malcolm X and Ahmad Jamal. And yeah, right. <laughs> That's how I felt when I figured it out. Um, but he used to, um, so my parents were, got separated when I was three. They finally got divorced when I was six. Uh, my mom and I moved back to Los Angeles and my dad moved back to Chicago. And uh, every summer, my mom would send me to Chicago to spend the summer with, with my dad. And my dad had a um, thick book called uh, Great American Negroes. And it had stories of Richard Wright, Langston Hughes, Mary McLeod Bethune, Marian Anderson. And he used to make me uh, read and then write book reports yes. on these people <laughs> during my summer vacation. Yes. And we're talking, and, and we're, talk we're talking six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old. He had me doing this, and you know, of course, I hated it because I was, you know, I came to Chicago to play and, and be mm -hmm. a kid. Um, but he'd make me do these book reports, and it wasn't until about uh, sixth grade. I had a book called uh, the, poems on, uh, the Poems on the Life and Death of Malcolm X. And it was my favorite book uh, at the time, and I used to keep it on my desk in class. And other kids used to tease me. they say, oh, somebody wrote a book about you? <laughs> and it was the first time that I yeah. really got what my father was instilling in me. I mean, he was teaching me things that my other classmates didn't know. They knew, of course, we knew Dr. King because of the page and a half that we learned in, in school. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, they didn't know Malcolm X. So if they didn't know Malcolm X, they didn't know Langston Hughes, they didn't know Richard Wright. And it, it filled in me, in sixth grade, a sense of pride and a sense of identity um, because I, under, I understood that my father was teaching me stuff that I was not learning in school and that my peers were not learning. So he really set me on the path uh, as, you know, as a really young person in uh, carrying that, that sense of identity. I was asking you a little bit earlier about that statistic that says 48% of African Americans have implicit racial bias against other black people. Mm -hmm. And so initially it was, the question was, is that accurate? So since you've already testified <laughs> to that moment, it is true. But so then the, the follow-up was, how do we deal with the deep conditioning against the self yeah. if the parent isn't there, right? If, yeah. if, or if the parent is there but not actively working against that conditioning against the self. Right. Um, now especially if the parent's not there. That's what makes it hard because it's the parent who provides that, you know, that environment. Um, or with the parent being there but unable to do that for whatever reason. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's that's a hard one because you, when you go out and you when you go out into the world, 
uh, unless it's a unless it's a thirst that the young person has mm -hmm. like like at, at the, the the conference uh this afternoon there was a young uh girl there uh, marley uh yeah. diaz mm -hmm. 11 years old she's in school and she's reading all these books about these white boys white boy and a dog and at 11 years old she said i'm tired of not being able to read uh, books about people who I identify with. So she started this campaign where she started uh, collecting books and having books donated uh, about young black people. And she would, you know, she started out with, uh, I think, like a thousand books. And she would give, she would donate those books to schools. I think she's up to like 4,000 books now. Um, and, you know, she's donated books to, I forgot, there was a bunch of cities that, that she was saying. But here's a young, a young, yeah girl who took it upon herself because there was a thirst that she had because there was there, there was a gap there was something missing that she needed uh, and she needed to see for herself something she needed to identify with um, I didn't really get a chance to really talk to her parents to figure out what it was they taught her right <laughs> you know to to one recognize the dissatisfaction but then to have the you know to, to do something about it um, you know, I'm not yet a parent, so uh, the concept of being a parent scares the death out of, uh, out of me. <laughs> but, you know, when I see young people like her, uh, that's something that, that excites me, just mm -hmm. the, the possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if it's, it, especially if it's something that, that the thirst is there, uh, you have to go out and find it. Like you said, the, uh, the importance of immersing yourself you know, in black culture. Because there is that, uh, again, my personal experience is there is a, a wonderful sense of identity that I carry with me no matter what the media mm -hmm. was showing me. Uh, when I was a kid, you know, like everybody else, I grew up watching Different Strokes and, and Good Times and Jeffersons, not because I liked those shows. I actually didn't like those shows, but they were the only black people I could see on television. Um, and then I remember when, you know, when Cosby came about, I really felt, and mind you, my life was nothing like, you know, like the Huxbulls at all, but just the way, just the way these people carried themselves, you know, I, you know, at some point through the run of the show, I felt like, wow, I was really, I was meant to be on the show because, you know, take the actor away, just the kid. Uh, you know, that's the show I wanted to see on television. These were the black people I wanted to see on television. These were the people I, I felt like uh, the little kid Malcolm at home could identify with, uh, with this show and with this family. But even with, you know, seeing the Jeffersons and different strokes and what you're talking about, Willis, that did not, those images did not shape my identity. So it is important, um, as you were saying, and Dr. Harrell was saying, that you've, you've got to immerse yourself in it so you can uh, you know, not be susceptible to what it is the media is, is, is bombarding you with. And so much of it, too, is about commentary. Uh, or the TV shows are really about commentary more than they are about this kind of thing of lived life. So if you think about the success of the show Blackish right now, so much of it has to do with the reality that middle class people our age without children are still trying to figure out how to raise children. Yeah. That last yeah. episode, or it wasn't the last, it's probably two episodes ago, the one where they focused on how do you have that conversation about the riots um, and the drop in of the ta coats between the world and me, where, you know, Junior, the, every kid, there's, you know, they're the static kinds of characters in some ways. There has to be the kid who's goofy, the kid who's smart, the kid who's a smart mouth, all this. So there's the kid who's coming into himself, who's reading this book, and his father is like, I've been saying this all along. Why does it take an author of a book right. to get you to say right. this thing? But right. the popularity of a Blackish has to do with middle class black people trying to figure out how to talk to their children. Mm -hmm. Like they don't want to deny them certain kinds of advantages that have come along the way through, you know, moving through class or income. But they are also a little bit skeptical that this could be dangerous if you don't understand who you are. Right. Sure. Sure, so sure. it's an interesting thing that there are shows that do that kind of work that catch sometimes, and it may very well have to do just with the times. It may be a kind of post-Ferguson, post-Baltimore moment, but I can remember read between the lines and thinking that that show was trying to do that right, thing. Right, right, right. 
many years before. Yeah. And ironically, with Tracy Ellis Ross as the mother. Yeah. So yeah. what do you think the difference is outside of here's the time? Does it have to be ABC? Can BET or a space like that sustain that kind of thing? Or how do, how do you begin to grapple with a concept that was there that didn't catch at the moment right, when you know right. it's right? Yeah. Um, I, so I've got to be, because uh, this is streaming, i got to be... <laughs> 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 huh, I got to figure out how, I could, how to work this. Um, the, the biggest <laughs> issue with uh, Read Between the Lines is Tracy and I were sold uh, one particular show. Um, and we all agreed on what the execution of what that show was going to be. And once we went into production, uh, it was like they were going, the network was going back into what they felt was definitely going to work, as opposed to this new execution we all agreed we were going to do. Um, so the biggest frustration with that show is uh, because Tracy and I were you know, also both producers on the show, Tracy and I were producing one show and BET was producing another show. So there were internal problems in terms of the direction of the show. Um, and, you know, just what, just your explanation of Blackish actually makes me want to go back and actually watch it. Um, because it's been, it's, it's, uh, to be honest, uh, to be very candid, it's been hard for me to really get into the show for a couple of reasons, but really for that reason, you know, the main reason, because that's the show we were trying to do. Yep. Um, and yes. we were it's doing very clear. it. Yeah, and we were doing it on the network that seemed like it would make the most sense. Just to do it. Oh. Um, oh. Go figure. <laughs> yeah. So that was, you know, so yeah, so, so that experience was frustrating. Um, but, you know, I, I, I applaud, and especially now, this is the first time I'm, I'm hearing uh, just the, the description of the show actually makes me as a viewer go, wow, I actually want to, I want to see how that's executed. Because um, I think, uh, interestingly enough, you know, you look at, uh, you know, you look at, at, at Cosby and that run and how, you know, one of the, uh, you know, most louder things about that show is they were black mm -hmm. without having to act black without having to talk about how hard it is to be black in America, um, without really having to, they were able to be unapologetically black without having to mention that right. they were black. It was in the culture, it was in the music, in the, in in the, the, in the dress, in the They're paintings on the wall. Um, so fast forward 20, 30 years later, <laughs> um, <laughs> And so it seems like the thing that works about Blackish is that they are actually uh, dealing with what it is to be black, you know, affluent yeah. black in America. Which again is, uh, I think, that's something that, uh, in terms of forward movement, you probably have to do that as opposed to doing a show that doesn't address it at all. Yeah. Because we've had that, and we've had that experience, and that experience has been. Uh, Obviously, so incredibly influential on uh, you know a generation of young people who have gone to college because of the influence on that show yep. and Different World, who have become doctors and, and lawyers because of the influence on that show, who have uh, you know started families so they can have loving families, uh, loving relationships with their spouse and their children. So there's so uh, such a huge uh, such a huge positive. Mm -hmm. Uh, social impact that that show has made, but because that show has done that, uh, I think you you know in, in order to have forward movement, you you know I get now Black is being a show where they, uh, you know what makes the show work is addressing all of those issues head on. I think it's a good thing that there is that kind of address there, but it doesn't quite do what a different world. Did, right, sure. Or yeah. even the Cosby Show did, yeah. for instance. So yeah. I was, I was clear. Yeah, a different world was catching lightning in a bottle. Yeah. And yeah. It, you can catch it over and over again if you know how to catch lightning in a bottle, and someone is willing to yeah. 
usher that in. Yeah. I don't yeah. know that we have that as a reality anymore. I can remember very clearly that episode, that there was the professor who was there all the time, the, the English professor whose name I can't remember, Roscoe Lee Brown. Brown. Roscoe Lee Brown. Right? Yeah, Roscoe Lee Brown. Yes, yes. So I knew I couldn't yes. be Roscoe Lee Brown, but I knew I wanted to be an English professor in part. Yes. But then when I saw Whoopi Goldberg, yes. Yes. Whoopi yes. comes on the yes. show and she says, you're a voice in this world and you deserve to be heard. I said, this is what I want to do. Yeah. This is absolutely what I want to do. In addition to the fact that you get to have a new cycle of kids every four years. You stay young. They go away. <laughs> <laughs> new ones come in. It's, it's just made yeah. perfect sense. Yeah. Although nobody, you know, people graduated, but they somehow stayed at Hillman. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> Which, right. again, seems to be, like, reflected, too, because I can't seem to leave Howard. <laughs> I don't want to, but... Right. That's <laughs> I, was, I was just, how long have you been back at Howard? So 11 years. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I tried. I went back home. I went back to Louisiana. Then I found myself back at Howard. But it's yeah. the it's the Space. There's something about it. And part of it, too, is the Debbie Allen connection with you see the sure, show change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you have students doing really interesting stuff in theses, like how a different world changes from seasons one and two to when Debbie Allen mm -hmm. takes over the show. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you know what's interesting? Um, so the, the original concept of Different World, it was about a white girl who goes yep. to a predominantly black uh, college. Yep. So Marissa Tomei, I think it is. Marissa, yeah, her, Marissa her Tomei. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And boy, she became a slacker right. with her career. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Right. She's she, yeah. she's killing it. Um, but yeah, so uh, you know th that concept changed when when Debbie came yep. in and, and and took over, and it became something totally different. Yeah. Asking the really hard questions that so many people wanted answers to, and creating a kind of energy that did feed the kind of thing that you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. We'll take a shift for a minute. We're going to segue a little bit into um, some really exciting things that are happening at the Kennedy Center. But while we're shifting, too, we want to give you the opportunity to like hold your cards up if you uh, want us to collect those and begin to have a part of that to become a part of the conversation in that way. But I want to mention, most of you have probably heard by now that um, there is new programming that's happening. Um, at the Kennedy Center where hip hop is at the center of the programming and Q-Tip has been named artist in residence and a lot of the, yes you can, well, yeah. for that. So it's at, and it's important too that it's at the core of the season. It's not like this thing that happens over on the side. It's not this thing that happens you know, during Black History Month, which we have to come back to. We absolutely have to come back to the Ben Carson. I, I wanted to decide <laughs> we, because when you said you had the book of you know the, the book that your dad had for you, right? We were talking in the hallway about there's so many posters that didn't go up this Black History Month because Ben Carson's on. <laughs> I, mean, I just don't want to see this. You know, right. how do you do that? He right? would never make the the Great American Negroes book. <laughs> <laughs> and he was so close. <laughs> he was so close. But back to the, and there was, well, there was one other thing that, one, one other semi-taboo that um, we, that I thought about as you were saying, is this live streaming? The Oscar So White moment. So that kind of beef with um, Jada Pinkett. And oh, I'm blanking on her name. Oh, Janet. Um, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Bib. Bib. And I, I really, yeah. 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 Um, so, in, in that moment, that delicate balance, right? Where you know I gotta work. So there's certain things that I can say, <laughs> but I can't say. But where, right. where Janet Hubert was clear is that there are certain things that you absolutely have to say. And even as an insider, you know, walking that walk is difficult and I think Kerry Washington tried to do a good job of it this year mm. where she was actually at the Oscars and she's like I really applaud people who stayed away and so she walked mm. that line nicely I think but how do you begin to critique the thing that is also feeding you right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and, and and it's funny because there's also the especially with 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 the Oscars specifically there's also you know the whole concept of boycotting the Oscars you know, there's the question of how can you boycott something you were never really a part of in no, the first right. place. Right. <laughs> you know, it's not like boy, you know, black people boycotting the Oscars is going to make the Oscars look much different <laughs> than years before. And that was kind of Chris Rock's point in part of his monologue that people didn't seem to get. Right. They thought yeah. he went like over the top. And part of his response too was over the top is like point zero 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 percent right. and the, even the Stacy da Stacy Stacy Dash moment I, I didn't watch so I can't speak uh, in real I didn't see it in real time I saw it retrospectively where she comes out and does this spot mm 
yeah. as the kind of um, liaison. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. It just went, all went terribly missed, bad, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in part because you aren't there. So like this big critique can't be this thing in the way that you want it to right, be because yeah. it wasn't your space to begin yeah, with. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the cool thing is that you know, uh, you know, the, the the board acted swiftly in trying right. to make some changes to be more more inclusive in terms of the academy members. Which I thought that was cool. I thought I thought that showed. Uh, it was a pleasant surprise and at least showed, um, I don't know if it's so much promise, but definitely showed active, uh, active you know, attempt to, to, to move forward. Yeah. So they should at least be you know, applauded for, for that, I think. Yeah. So there was this thing that you said to move back to the hip hop conversation, this thing that you said about like, the music that you do, which I think it kind of explains of what a lot, if this will resonate, you're gonna get an mm moment out of this one, I think. You say, <laughs> quote, a lot of the content in hip hop doesn't speak to those of us who are older. Mm. But, <laughs> well, I ain't even saw it yet. <laughs> but we still want music we can bob our heads to. Mm. Music mm. with an edge to it, for a lot of people in my generation, straight ahead jazz can be too heady mm. and not accessible enough. So what I do with Miles Long is give you a little bit of both. It's got the jazz sensibility, but it's definitely got the funk, but it also has this hip hop edge. Mm. So what you're trying to do, interestingly enough, may begin to explain how hip hop becomes a centerpiece moment. We can know the hip hop, the Kennedy Center gotta integrate us, right? Yeah. <laughs> we have to be brought yeah. into this conversation. Yeah. So talk a little bit, if you will, about what you think it means to attempt to integrate hip hop into core programming to such a, um, typically what we would think of as traditional artistic space that does not attempt to make hip hop traditional either. Right, right. Yeah. Um, the, the wonderful thing ab about hip hop is how it's gone from, you know, used to be this, you know, black music. Now it's youth music, it's pop music. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, it's gotten to a point where it's undeniable. I mean, financially, it's undeniable. Um, it's permeated uh, every other form of music, um, mm -hmm. except maybe classical at this point. Um, so it's such, uh, uh, it's such an important part of, uh, of American culture at this point. And like I said, it's undeniable. So I think for the Kennedy Center to, uh, you know, to invite that and to want to be a part of that is very definitely forward thinking. Um, and you know, the fact that it's actually uh, really appreciated as art. Mm -hmm. I mean, even though there's, you know, probably in, in every field, like there's always, you know, fluff and uh, just nonsense, um, you know, so hip hop has that, but there is, the fact that it is being recognized as an art says a lot uh, in terms of how far the art form has become, uh, how far the, the art form has come, uh, and that recognition, I think, is extremely important because there's, there's still a lot to learn from as hip hop continues to evolve. Um, you know, as the uh, you know, as the hip hop artists get older, as the hip hop audience gets older, uh, I think there's still there's still room for growth and for some interesting things to come out of the art form, the culture. Yeah, I'm thinking about the Grammys too. Of course, with the Kendrick Lamar performance. Did you happen to see it? I didn't see. It. I saw I saw clips of so it, man. Yeah, the, the Kendrick Lamar yeah. performance, um, as we're talking about award shows and, and, and Grammys, I think attempted to bring into the mainstream a very clear sense of place that never attempted to be mainstream. Mm -hmm. But to, since I'm in this space, I'm going to be who I am and have people try to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And a lot of conversation has come out of that from the music critics especially uh, Kanye drops the album, of course, and it doesn't give the, um, the critics enough time to like, try to figure it out. So there's this piece in The New Yorker that says, you're really doing a disservice to the critique if you don't give us enough time to listen to the piece. Well, you should be sharp enough, to some degree, <laughs> to pick it up, right? There's that moment. Although, I admit, because I knew I was going to class the next day, yeah. I, pay, I watched Formation with Beyonce yeah. over and over and over and over and over and over because at, my first response was, this juxtaposition isn't working for me. Yeah. This isn't like, right, right, but I kept, I got it mm. eventually. I got it, I got, there were really good reads. Mm. My, my point here is two days later, <laughs> two days later, there's a really sharp sister who read that thing in ways as if she had produced it where I missed so much 
that I thought, well, of course Beyonce didn't get this. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. The fact that she, no, but mm, the fact that, the fact, I don't have to worry about it. Right. <laughs> I, mean, I don't have to worry about it. But the, she, there wow. were some things that she didn't get, but the wow. fact that she was willing to wow. risk it. Sure. Sure. And for someone who is very clearly mainstream. Sure. And sure. to risk it during the Super Bowl, even in an exploitive moment. Yeah. Sure. It's complicated, right? Yeah. It's, sure. it's clearly yeah. exploitive. Yeah. yeah. The day before, so all eyes on me moment. All right, yeah, I, I get it. But then you also have standing in the space. We're being willing to stand in the space on your own terms. Yeah. Yeah. How important is that to you as an artist? <sighs> Quite honestly, I would probably be working a lot more mm. if it wasn't important to me. And uh, it's a real, you got a real, uh, a real spot with me because it can be, uh, it's very frustrating um, coming from you know, what Mr. Cosby set out to do with that show, um, the social impact of the show, and I've always been, I've always been very meticulous about the work that I do. Um, between the work that I turn down mm -hmm. and the work that I bust my ass to get and don't get, there are stretches uh, of unemployment that go longer than I'd <laughs> like for them to. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it's frustrating at times. It's heartbreaking at times. Um, and, you know, there are some instances where I'll look at something and, you know, I know I don't want to, I know I don't even want to go out and audition for this. You know, I um, um, I had a interesting. I, I had a, a project that I actually I, I went out for for political reasons. The casting director, you know, black woman I hadn't seen and she hadn't seen my work in a long time. So I said, let me go in, so at least she can see my work. And the uh, I won't say the the person uh, whose show this is, but um, you know, I'm auditioning and I'm in the audition room and I just got this. The sick stomach, this, this sick feeling in my stomach. Because I was like, why am I sitting here co signing this? Like, I, I could not do this show. If they, if they hired me, if they wanted to hire me, I would, I would have to walk away. I'd have to yet again walk away from a show and walk away from potential employment, walk away from uh, a great paycheck. Um, and those are. Those are things to have to think about constantly. Mm -hmm. And what gets frustrating is I know that a role that I will turn down, there's 12 other cats in line yeah. waiting to take that. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to be grateful and look at the blessing that, uh, that I can, that I am in a position that I can turn mm -hmm. down work. Um, doesn't mean I don't have to work uh, for the rest of my life. It doesn't mean that at all. Um, you know, it doesn't mean I don't need to work, but you know, so far my mortgage and my bills are getting paid and not contingent upon my next job. But it does make it frustrating because oftentimes you know, I'm out here and you know, like I wonder, like who even cares about what I'm doing? Malcolm Minetti is a, a, a really a perfect, perfect uh, uh, example. So I, you know, I spent eight years at NBC under Mr. Cosby's wing in an environment where he made everyone ultra aware of the images of people of color that were putting across the airwaves. Then I get to UPN, um, which was like. It was like being at a top university and then going to a like community college. Wait. Oh. <laughs> wow. Okay. I'm wrong. Community wrong audience. Huh? Yes. Okay. Uh, cool. I'll take that. I'll take that. But it was I was I was someplace where um, the craft was 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 highly regarded. Okay. 
and I was, you know, placed some place where, uh, you know, the the craft was not as highly regarded. So maybe maybe that's not the right. Uh, and thank you for stopping me. I get that. I get that. I get that. So damn, I got to find another analogy now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Leave it to a professor. Yeah. Um, it was a two-year school and a four-year yeah. school. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not better or worse. Not better or worse, yeah. Stepping stone. Yeah, so I got to find something else because it was clearly a worse situation. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I know. So thank you for, thank you for correcting me. Thank you for correcting me. Um, and what made it so bad was I'm thinking, okay, I know what UPN is about, but you know, they know where I come from. Mm -hmm. They know that I, you know, I was on a, 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 a history-making show that showed that black people can be funny without being stereotypical. Mm -hmm. right. And I watched how Mr. Cosby ran that show. Um, the, the stereotypical things that you did not see on that show was not because the writers were not writing them. Mm -hmm. It was because Mr. Cosby was, no, this is not the show that we're doing. So I watched him do that from year one to year eight. So I come to UPN like, okay, you know, despite whatever other programming they have, you know, it's time to really do some, you know, do some work. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to the school, University of Bill Cosby, why? <laughs> you know, and I got there and nobody cared. Um, I, was, I was almost on a daily basis fighting writers. And it was like, wow, I don't think anyone really care I'm trying to do <laughs> to make, make Malcolm and Eddie different from the other, you know, programming they were doing. Um, and it became, I, I used to go home, I used to literally drive home in tears because I was so frustrated um, and, 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 and felt, not helpless, but I just felt like I, would, I was not able to do the kind of work that I would, and especially being so conscious about the images of people of color that, you know, putting across the airwaves. Um, the great thing about, uh, the great takeaway from that experience is knowing that from that experience I can work with anybody. Um, but the frustration with that show, because I was, I was acting, I was directing on the show, I was producing on the show, and I felt like I was the only person caring about the show. So the takeaway was it really made me look into, it made me pick up an instrument, um, I'd always wanted to play an instrument, but I was always intimidated. But I realized I need a hobby. I need something that's not acting. I need something that's not directing. Um, I need something that's not going to, uh, that's going to you know, give me some other kind of creative fulfillment and not just be locked into the frustration of the show. So, uh, you know, my, you know, getting much deeper into poetry and being on the spoken word scene, mm -hmm. uh, picking up an instrument, starting my band, and uh, that hobby actually turning into, you know, a whole nother career, uh, you know, all of that came out of the frustration of being on that show. But how I carry myself and how I um, represent as a black man moving through this world and through this uh, industry is very important to me. And, you know, I hold on to that, but sometimes it's, sometimes it can be heartbreaking, to be honest. I think we have two questions that are rather related, so I'm going to try to combine okay. them and see if Thank you for the we water. can speak to those that way. It's an ambitious one, but it may not be at all. It says, how far off do you think you are from being the head of a studio or a network? And what would that mean? Mm. And then who or what should we be aware of in entertainment to protect our communities from unjustifiable and negative images mm. in the future? Mm. So mm. I think they're related, and you've already begun sure. to spoke to them a little bit. but. Sure. I noticed too how you didn't blink at all when I said, how far are for you? From You were like, whoa, no. He was like, next week. Right. <laughs> Stay tuned. MJW. Right. <laughs> right. Um, that, you know, that's, uh, I'm so very far off. That's like so not even my lane. Um, look, Oprah. Lover, hater, however you feel about her, um, running a network of your own is ambitious. And whatever hope people had for 
her programming and you know um, mm -hmm. you know how wonderful it seemed you know she was going to have this network and the wonderful things this network was going to do and I think on some levels I think there is some programming that is some you know really awesome programming um, but that is a difficult undertaking and that's Oprah yeah. right I don't have a fraction of Oprah's dough <laughs> <laughs> or power um, but but to the point of uh, studio heads and studio executives one of the one of the areas where our industry really needs uh, really really needs to grow is having people of color in those executive positions, in those green lighting positions. Um, because yes, it's, it, it's great to have uh, you know, directors of color and writers of color and producers of color, but at the end of the day, there are still gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. And the industry, um, especially in those gatekeeping positions, is still run by people who have a, uh, a certain, um, generally people who have uh, minimal contact with people of color. So there is still, uh, you know, there's still an old mentality, there's still a, uh, that they see people of color that, you know, keeps, you know, it, it keeps the struggle alive. <laughs> but at the same time, there is a viewing public that is so conditioned by certain images um, so even when we talk about you know the you know, the kind of programming that can be detrimental to the psyche of you know of people of color um, those shows are being supported mm -hmm. those shows have an audience um, people who uh, you know like certain kind of uh, you know stereotypical you know black product um, there's an audience for that. Those people make their voices heard. I think people who are not into that type of programming, and there's other kind of programming that shows people of color in you know much different lights. They don't. Uh, you know, our voices aren't being heard as loudly. Uh, the support for uh, that kind of product is not there. So from a business standpoint. If I'm a business person and I'm investing money in, you know, this product here that's going to make a whole lot of money because it has an it has an audience that shows up every time I put this out, or spend that kind of money on this over here that uh, you know could be really great for uh, you know culturally great could be great for uh, the psyche of an audience. Um, well, there's not. That audience doesn't always show up. Yeah. So when it comes to the business side of this business, what people are looking for is a return on their investment. So I think we have to, uh, you know, the things that we like, we have to support. We have to uh, be diligent about showing up, and you know, and, and 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 putting that word of mouth out there, and making sure that we of like minds are supporting, you know, the kind of product that we like. And I think that was kind of what I was trying to get at when we were talking about, you know, the generation moving over to hip hop mm. and why it becomes a part of a Kennedy Center audience. So I think I was telling by earlier, um, one of the things that I volunteer to do has to do with being on judge panels for um, DC Commission of the Arts, for instance, which I'm pretty sure I'm not supposed to say out loud, but <laughs> act like I didn't. Because remember, this is just our um, living room. but. <laughs> Part of that has to do with audience, right? And mm -hmm. being aware of what's possible. So when that kind of programming happens in this space and our generation comes in and says we want to be a part of it, then that begins to say it is possible to do the full range of hip hop. It doesn't have to be the stereotypical. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be this, that, that full range that moves from a really conscious artist to an artist who is working with students. So I think I can't remember the, the last one in the program, the remixing the art for social change. Mm -hmm. Where you got the brother with everything from soccer balls, the kinetic movement in the hip hop. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. 
working with students, but then also um, creating an audience. And then um, one of the questions had to do with Hamilton, for instance, on Broadway, and whether or not you had seen it, and whether or not, or you had any thoughts on that. But how do you begin to deal with what this uh, person is called grown folk hip hop? Right. Which is which is real. I mean, because right. there is an audience for that, and yeah. at this point, that's where money is. Yeah. And how yeah. do you and and that money in the exploitive way? But we we can afford the ticket. Yeah. We can yeah. afford to support it. And one of my good friends says this all the time, and I think she's absolutely right. But I still make the mistake often. We have the money to support it. She says, "Well, you know, support sounds like you're doing somebody a favor. You're not doing them a favor. This is excellent, <laughs> right? Yeah. So read my book yeah. because it's excellent. Yeah. Don't yeah. read it to support me and put it on the shelf. Yeah. So th that mark and that level of expectation. So we have, we have to support these excellent things as you are indicating. How do you do that? How do, how do you capitalize on that? And I can't even use the language right because I don't want to say capitalize, mm. right? <laughs> how do you um, bring together an audience of like-minded people to require excellence? Ah, interesting, interesting. With that full range, all the way from hip hop over to Hamilton, right. which uh, t uses hip hop. You can't get a ticket to Hamilton still. Yeah, that's why I've not seen it. Right. <laughs> I think you could yeah. probably get a ticket, but you know, I, you know what, what I mean. I right? thought I could probably get a ticket right. too. <laughs> but the last two times I was in New York, I, I could not. You know what? I, I even got in the uh, the lottery thing to see if right. I could get it. You know, it was serious. But, you know, they were like, no, you need, we need a little more time. So, like, I'd have to know I'm coming to New York, like, you know, a couple of weeks in advance and see if I could get a ticket. But it's um, you know, everything that I've heard about it. Is just it's been wonderful, and and the fact that that I can't get a ticket um, is is beautiful, I and think, bizarre. Yes, you know, but, yeah. and bizarre, yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know what? Honestly, if you know, maybe had I taken one of those jobs, I I, I turned down, then I'd paid seven hundred dollars <laughs> for a ticket. <laughs> Principally, um, I, I haven't seen it and hadn't paid close attention to the reviews. It, I remember initially the coming out of it, and that kind of, that revisionist history kind of scared me, to be honest with mm, you. Mm. Like, I don't know, can we really? Mm, interesting. And putting this like hip hop twist on it, or putting this interesting kind of contemporary moment on, Hamilton's still a very complicated person. Are those layers right, there? Right, sure. So sure, I want to see it sure. too, but it's going to have to be at less than Right. Seven hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah, tell me too. Tell <laughs> I don't even have, you know, MJW money. So, a couple of other um, questions about um, course. This one says, "How do you stay the course um, in terms of the challenges that you face?" And I think you be had begun to spoke to that uh, a little bit. And we may have time for maybe one or two other questions, and then Malcolm's going to close for us with some spoken words. So we'll look at these. But staying the okay. course, and then. We talked about this on the reality to television oh, yeah. moment, how it has impacted um, the way that we think about programming, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. even particularly the perception of African Americans. And then um, I'll save the last one because it's different from okay. these two that are somewhat related. Okay. Um, the, 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 so we'll start with the staying the course. Yeah. Um, that is, I mean, that's literally a daily consciousness that I carry um, and looking at looking at the or being reminded of the bigger picture of my path um, and my journey um, as we were talking earlier about pilot season so you know in in, in LA in the business whatever uh, television pilot season is from January to March, and it's where all the networks are casting for their new shows. Um, and uh, as uh, a friend of mine says, pilot season is a breeding ground for depression. <laughs> <laughs> Therapists are happy. Man, yeah. Um, so even this pilot season, I got close to uh, four projects that I really thought were going to go my way. And in the eleventh hour, you know, they didn't go my way. And I've been in this business long enough to know, as I was saying, working actors. Check this out: working actors have a ninety-four percent rejection rate, and that's those of us who work. So I know that I'm used to. I'm used to getting told on a whole lot of stuff. But every now and then, there are you know some products that you really want. And you really think this is. You know, this is the career game changer for me. Um, so I had, I've had four 
I've had four, three of those four really hit me hard. Um, and I had to uh, be reminded by some people in my life of what my, uh, what my bigger picture is. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's not about, uh, you know, this particular role that I thought was going to be the game changer. Um, I've been in this business uh, for 30 something years <laughs> um, and still, you know, have m many years to go, but just, you know, being reminded of who I am and what I represent and being reminded of, uh, you know, that, you know, that kid that, you know, my father instilled all this, this stuff into. My dad, like when he listens to, um, when he listens to my music, he oftentimes, you know, looks at me with such uh, incredulousness, like, 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 brother, you are, you are deep, like, you know. And I have to remind him, no, but dad, this is, this is the manifestation of all of the work, yeah, all those summers, right? And, and naming me Malcolm Jamal and just all the work that you've put into me, this is the manifestation of that. Um, so it's those kind of reminders that I have to, you know, remind myself what my path is. So uh, staying the course, uh, you know, it, it's the thing that I guess really keeps me alive because I don't get a chance to numb out and dull my senses because in this business, rejection, frustration, uh, those are all the things that keep you alive, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's a daily part of, of my, uh, I won't say struggle, but part of my, my journey, my life, really. And the pilots you were saying, or the amount that it takes to do a scripted show and pilot season is very different from a reality show where right. you, you know, you literally throw it out and see what sticks. Yeah, yeah. Because so, yeah, when that, the person was asking how reality television has impacted um, perceptions. Yeah. Well, well, re reality television, first of all, has changed the financial face of television. Because for the money you'd spend on a scripted show, you can, you know, shoot three or four reality shows. Doesn't matter if they're good or not. You know, you shoot them, you throw them up against the wall to see what sticks. Um, and it's just, it's just, it's less expensive. It's less hassle. You don't have to deal with, deal with unions. You don't have to deal with, with, with writers. Um, so that has really hurt, uh, that's hurt the integrity of the business a lot. Um, a, uh, what was such a small pool in terms of projects out there for actors has now become uh, even more shallow. Um, because you, you even have feature film actors who are feeling it so much they want to go to television. So it's really changed, uh, it's really changed the industry and with that, I think it's, it's had a, an impact on the audience. Uh, you know, you're, you're talking about, uh, you know, an audience that was already ADD. <laughs> <laughs> and you support that with reality television. Um, you know, it, it, there, there are some people I know who look at reality television as just a guilty pleasure and just, you know, a chance to numb out. But there are people who live for yeah this stuff um, and like it or you know love it or hate it it is a force with which we have to contend in this industry but it's you know there's always in this business there's always this, this, the struggle between business and art that's nothing new it's always uh, you know w that struggle has always been there and it's those choices that uh, you know sometimes you have to decide Okay, today, am I going to be a business person or am I going to be an artist? Mm -hmm. And that's a, you know, that's a decision that you know, many artists in, in, in every field has to make. That business element, I think, um, is how I'll try to segue into this final question about the developments at MSNBC, uh, especially recent mm -hmm. circumstances um, around Melissa Harris Perry's leaving uh, Nerdland. And the person couched the question in the context of like-minded persons in Hollywood or the other question about being in the a studio head or exec and how like-minded people in Hollywood might 
cohere in such a way to create a certain amount of um, energy and power that would prevent the kinds of things maybe that happened. Um, and a lot of the commentary most of you are probably familiar with has to do with the fact that, um, I can't remember the exact term, but people were describing it as, you know, MSNBC had Obama programming. It was ushered into this age of Obama, right? Mm. Mm. We're already, before the man leaves office, wow. we're, we're post-Obama, wow. right? You wow. got you phase out, and you wow. don't dare, like, buck up. Wow. Yeah. Before you leave, before, really? Yeah. It ain't January yet. So yeah. we're having that, like, that presidential, like, how the debate has completely, the, yeah. or the debates, like, the presidential moment is over. Yeah. The yeah. kinds of things that w are happening now that would never have happened sure. in a presidential debate space or moment or at a rally. Um, it's a similar kind of thing. The kinds of things that we see happening very actively and overtly on networks, mm. I don't know that we would have seen them. No. Like, how do no, you begin no. to grapple with yet another complicated layer yeah. of the realities of popular culture? Yeah, yeah. And black people in popular culture. Yeah. There wasn't a question in there. It's just a conversation. You. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's funny, because as we think about it, I think what you just said, uh, we can credit that to reality television. <laughs> um, you know, reality television, to a large extent, has lowered, has helped to lower the bar of what we see as quality, and especially what we see as quality on television. So um, it allows the presidential debates not to be so presidential. Yeah, to degenerate. Yeah, because people are used to seeing, you know, classless behavior on television. Yeah. And in some way, that classless behavior is looked at as more real. So it really has an effect on, uh, it has an effect on, on, on what we see on television and how people carry themselves knowing they're going to be on television. What is that thing that, I didn't let you answer the question earlier when we were talking because I said I wanted to ask you here mm. and didn't want to change the answer, right? Mm. What is that thing that you think is being tapped into that clearly everybody wanted to say this, but they wouldn't, and so now you hear people say it. So we were talking about how Somehow, Trump's message is resonating yeah. with so many people, and so what do you think it mm. is that is resonating? Uh, the so okay, so there's this, you know, the, the concept of how Obama has been divisive and he's divided our country and, and all of that. Um, and of course, you know, the feeling is like, no, that stuff is it's just been there, right? Um, and you know, it's bubbling to the surface um, because people are, you know, there's a scapegoat. Now that uh, that surface is like it's, it's like the 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 top of the uh, pot has been completely taken off, mm -hmm. and you've got people now who uh, see Trump as you know we now have a voice. So there are supporters who yes he's saying exactly what we've been thinking mm -hmm. like you know there there is a there is a a a culture of white people who feel like they cannot be free to defend uh, how they feel um, about people of color um, about affirmative action about how people of color are just taking over everything. Um, so there are people who've not felt like they've really had a forum to really express that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, whether you agree or not, that's very clearly a very real expression and very real feelings that these people have. That in someone like Trump, they now feel like they can celebrate uh, that perspective and can be vocal about it. And you've got, you know, Trump who, you know, you go to his rallies and, you know, you know, there is a, I, I guess, unspoken uh, uh, incitement of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, violence, violence and negativity yeah. against people who are different and who, uh, you know, who are coming there to protest. Like, that's being supported. And I think the the scary thing is not so much Trump, but the Trump followers. So it's going to be you know it's it's, it's going to be really interesting. However this thing plays out, uh, th that that cat that mentality has been yeah. let out the bag. Yep. You know. Yeah.
can't unring that bell. You can't unring that yep. bell. Yeah. Well, thank you for the conversation, yeah. but I want to make sure that we end with your spoken word piece. So we'll okay. say thank you for the conversation. Okay, and thank you. Thank you. Um, throw your hands in the air, wave them like you just don't care. Come on, throw your hands in the air, wave them like you just don't care. Throw your hands in the air, wave them like you just don't care. Now keep them there. It's a brand new dance called the stop and frisk. Sitting around simply getting pissed at an establishment that was designed to legally keep you second class is an exercise in Don Quixote futility. For we have the ability to make change. For we are master magicians. Like Harry Houdini, sidestepping positions meant to contain us, Take a derogatory word used to name us, flip and in song, make so famous, white kids use it amongst themselves as a term of endearment. If that's not magic, then what would you call it? Maybe an experiment gone awry? The die has been cast, and history proves that we know how to outlast inhumane conditions placed upon us. From the African Holocaust, to young black lives lost at the hands of those meant to protect us, to the systematic intent to misdirect us through miseducation, unemployment, and the inflation of poverty, because yesterday even being broke is pretty damn expensive. But the joke is that this racial divide that divides us, well, it's magic too, for it allows classism to continue to hide right there in plain view. It's an age-old system that's always allowed the 1% to rule. But let me ask you, what would you do if you and a small other few needed to protect the financial power that you have over the masses? How do you keep them from uprising, organizing, and enforcing majority rules. If you could fool one group into believing that they're better than the other group, wouldn't you? Then couldn't you use that same system to inflict inferiority and self-hate? Because I believe we now live the American mind state Malcolm warned us about at the Oxford Union debate in 1964 because we have been conditioned to hate the oppressed more than the people doing the oppressing. Yes. Jim Crow redressed. It's distressing that America loves black culture, but not black people. Not seeing that we already know we are equal. No, what we are fighting for is to uproot the system that has historically gone out of its way in an attempt to prove that we are not. The contempt the working white class has been taught to have for blacks goes so far back, many don't even recognize how deeply ingrained it is in their being. Has them mad at affirmative action without seeing the system of oppression that made it a necessity in the first place. Claiming reverse discrimination as if they were the first race who got passed over simply because of the color of their skin. And that which should serve as enlightenment and further reason for all of us to unite against the system that's actually oppressing us all has only created more hate. And after two terms, count it. Two terms, enjoy it while it lasts. After two terms with the black president, I too wish America was post-race. But my melanin challenge friends, she is not. So that means that you, me, we, have got to open our eyes and see this country for what it truly is beautifully flawed. 
birthed through violence, rape, loot, pillage, destroying families, homes, burning entire villages to the ground, teaching us that Native Americans were the bad guys until we came around and realized, yo, the cowboys were fucking thugs. We are born into an America that declares a war on drugs while at the same time funneling drugs into low economic neighborhoods and then citing an increase in crime. We make up 13.2% of the country, yet 40% of the people doing time. Shouldn't we all be perplexed by this prison industry complexity? And in some liberals' minds, even today, believe that if we just act right, then all of our problems would go away. <laughs> now, we can't take self-responsibility and self-accountability off the long list of solutions, but we also can't ignore a system that's created conditions that would quite possibly skew your point of view if you, too, lived the lives of those most affected. Translation. Anger at us is misdirected. But guess what? We still persevere. After hundreds of years of trying to be written off, you know, the foot that keeps kicking the dog eventually will get bitten off. Black lives matter. Yet human rights is our quest. And as you can see throughout history, we fight until the death. Like Mike Brown, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland, we fight until we give you our very last breath. Because we have the ability to make change. Because we are masters magicians. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you Let's hear it again. Let's hear it again for Malcolm Jamal Warner and Dr. Dana Williams. I'd like to thank everyone who uh, made it out this evening and those that are watching uh, via stream. Uh, we appreciate that we were able to engage you in such a pressing conversation. Uh, we were really committed here at uh, Community Engagement at the Kennedy Center to uh, involve the community that is here in D.C. as well as those that are abroad uh, in, in the work that we do. So it's important that right now you all don't think we have to leave or get out of here as they say, uh, you ain't got to go home. Would you, you don't have to right now. What we want to do is give you the opportunity, and we have everybody with name tags on, uh, give you the opportunity to mingle and, and share some, some, some good words with, with each other and also uh, meet Brother Malcolm here uh, so that we can all be connected. Uh, we're committed to having a creative ecosystem, and we know that that's what we're a part of. So in that right, we want to make sure that uh, we thank everybody that made out from Howard University. Uh, we thank Head Rush Agency for being a part of this and bringing us this wonderful talent here. And uh, in a few moments, we're just going to open up the space. Everyone can have an opportunity to mingle a little bit more. And those online, uh, I guess you all can watch us do that. So thank you once again. Let's hear it one more time for Malcolm John Warner and Dr. Dana Williams. Thank you. I can't 
Oh! 